بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد خلقنا الإنسان في أحسن تقويم ثم عددناه أسفل سافلين إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وعملوا الصالحات فلهم أجر غير ممنون فلهم أجر غير ممنون صدق الله العظيم basic translation of these three verses from Surah 18 is <coughs> start with I seek protection in the Lord in Allah from the shaitan the accursed and in the name of Allah the beneficent the merciful and this is what the meaning of these three verses are verily for sure <coughs> we have created man in the best of all in the best of all then, depending upon what the man does, then we reduced him to the lowest of law. Two extremes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us in the best of form, the best of states. The best we can do, the best we have the capacity to do. And you are doing something very good. And then, accept those. And then Allah said that we reduced the man to the lowest of the law, except those who have conviction of doing things, who believe and do righteous deeds, good deeds. Then they shall have the reward from the Lord without any question. These are the basic meanings of this. The reason I picked these three ayahs is I was told that I have to do a recitation and do the meaning according to what the situation is going to be. And I thought to myself sorry, that this is a wonderful work which will not benefit only to Javed but also to the whole community. We would be able to contribute on individual basis and also on collective basis once we know our rights what we are supposed to be doing and how we will be doing and how will we be using our intellect and capacity to make a difference in the governance, the overall governance of this country and also that will be extremely benefit to everybody. So I thank you for the invitation and congratulate you for the wonderful work which you will be doing here and also Thank you very much. Things that we do in the Interfaith Committee. We try to build bridges so that we can have open communication, dialogue, so that we can learn about how to be a part of this greater community that's very diverse. Um, I want to let you know about a little bit of the past events that we've done. We've done Open Mosque Day. Um, we did an event here um, called Waking in Oak Creek which was about the shooting um, at the Sikh temple in Wisconsin. Um, we had a question and answer session after, um, and I think we had um, Oak Creek mayors um, here. We had a number of people from the Sikh community. Um, and it was just a very emotional presentation that day. Um, we also recently in February uh, for Black History Month had a presentation on how African Americans have really paved the way for us. They've really worked on rights, not just for themselves, but they've really made life for us easier to get rights um, and to understand how to advocate for, for ourselves. Um, there are a couple of future events um, that we'll be hosting. There's an interfaith iftar that we'll be doing here at the MEC. Um, and there's also an Abrahamic storytelling that we'll also be doing at the MEC. Um, and then the other thing that we do is we serve as MCC's representatives when other people of interfaith communities or churches ask us to either um, join with them in doing things or ask for speakers. 
Um, one of the things that, uh, two of the things actually we'll be doing is an interfaith spring retreat and um, something called um, What Do Scriptures Teach? And it'll be on a topic where we look at the different scriptures from the Abrahamic faiths and what they teach us about how to behave with each other or within our own communities. Um, we do welcome anyone that wants to be a part of us, help us. Um, you know, this is a very welcoming group, Akhtar Sadek. Um, Pai is the chair. But I want to let you know that we're all like really nice and easy to get along with. Um, and we would welcome anyone who, who would like to take part in, in as little or in as great a way as you want. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell you about these very, they, they have very impressive resumes and I, can't, I don't want to read all of it. But I do want to share a little bit with you about, um, you know, we're very, very fortunate to have these three with us today. Um, um, uh, the three people here, Reema Kapoor, who is the Executive Director of South Asian American Policy and Research Institute, which we'll refer to as SAPRI from now on. Uh, Shweti Roy, and actually Shweta Roy, thank you, sorry about that. Um, she is the Community Research Fellow for SAPRI. And Steve Moon, who is the Director of Organizing, uh, Director of Organizing Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago. Uh, and a little bit about each of these three. Reema Kapoor is the Executive Director of the South Asian American Policy and Research Institute. Established in 2001, SAPRI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with the mission to serve South Asian Americans in the Chicago area and neighboring suburbs by using research to formulate equitable and socially responsible policy recommendations. Reema is an attorney who has focused on business and employment litigation for 10 years. Rima has authored and co-authored a variety of articles and blogs relating to the intersection of law and business, ethics of social media, as well as business and employment regulations and other topics. Throughout her career, Rima has been committed to community service, seeking meaningful, meaningful opportunities to promote diversity and civic engagement and build professionalism. Shweta Roy is a community research fellow with SAPRI. With an MBA from India and a passion for primary research, she is involved in designing, conducting, and analyzing SAPRI research projects. Currently, she is assisting SAPRI in voter mobilization project for 2016 elections. Steve Moon is the director of Organizing and Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago. He has over a decade of experience in youth development and organizing. Steve holds an MSW from the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration an MA in Asian American Studies from UCLA, and a BA in English from the University of Michigan. Through his work with Advancing Justice Chicago and his other community affiliations, Steve is committed to liberatory pedagogy, critical creative arts, including hip hop, and mental health for immigrant and refugee communities. At this time, I would like to ask all three of you, or Rima, to please come on up and take over for me. met some of you then, and I'm really happy to be back with my co-presenters today. Thank you for having SAPRI and Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago uh, talk to you about what it means, what's at stake for the South Asian American community in the elections, 2016 elections. But hopefully some of the information we'll share with you today, we have a lot of data, we have some information about uh, what it means to vote, uh, why it is important for our community to vote. Hopefully some of this information will be useful to you as you think about the broader sense of civic engagement. You know, voter is a primary indicator of civic engagement, voting. But there are many ways to, to be civically engaged with your communities. And by being here at this forum, this is a part of civic engagement a part of being uh, involved in something bigger than ourselves. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, as uh, Noshina mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of SAPRI. Um, I'm here with Shweta Roy, who is a Community Research Fellow for the organization, and I'm going to turn it over to her to give you a, a brief introduction of SAPRI and our organization. From your daily busy schedules and being here for a much needed discussion to emphasize the importance of South Asian Americans, their roles, and their representation. 
Let me start by giving a small introduction about South Asian American Policy and Research Institute. It was established in 2001 with the mission of using research as a primary tool to figure out the issues <coughs> and concerns of our specific community. Now further, we take the knowledge from this research into proposing public, public, uh, public, uh, uh, public policy recommendations and uh, for a equal opportunity environment. Now we have worked in healthcare, education, hate crime. Now why do we do this? We are one of the rapidly growing community, not only in Illinois, but in the whole of the nation. Today we will bring forth a lot of data, a lot of research that is there that emphasizes the numbers of South Asian Americans in the country. Further, it emphasizes our ability to stand up collectively and effectively and state our concerns. Now, when I say collectively, we, we have our unique uh, set of challenges arising from our diversity, our characteristics of the community, and um, our specific needs. So the research part helps in figuring that out and we try to take it further from there. So from the key findings of the research, we would be able to have more, we intend to have more participation in civic engagement, or, you know, more civic engagement awareness in the South Asian American community per se. And by articulating issues and concerns, we hope to be able to serve this community better. Now I would ask Rima to take further the presentation and the debate. And uh, Steve, before we go on, uh, I wonder if we can uh, have some audience participation. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shweta. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned we have a lot of data that we're excited to present to you. We have a lot of um, uh, information that we want to present to you. But a very important part of us being here today, uh, as Shweta mentioned, SAFRI and Asian Americans Advancing Justice, the way that we represent our communities is to hear from you. We want to hear from you what are the issues and concerns that are important to the South Asian community. And we take that information and research and we use that to um, put together our policy and programming. So today I want to, you know, we're, gonna, we're talking about civic engagement. We're talking about what it means for the South Asian community to go out to vote in 2016. And I'm wondering if some of you would share with us what are the important concerns for you and your community uh, that you feel should be represented in the 2016 elections? What is going to drive you to the polls? What are some things that matter to, you, to each of you? Uh, I would love to hear from people, and I can come around with the mic, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you, the whole panel. We really like to welcome at NEC and uh, the presentation that we're going to have on behalf of our committee. We'd like to thank all of you uh, being here and the audience. I uh, really appreciate the committee being here so far. The question, one of the concerns, you know, uh, it can be, it is universal that all of us know, but even from local uh, point of view also is the Islamophobia uh, topic. That's uh, very near and dear to all of us here, and I'm sure a lot of uh, people at large out there, they don't like to listen uh, this kind of rhetoric, uh, there have been uh, so many churches and other faith-based organizations, they have poured the support to the Muslim community, to us, our organizations and all that, that we are with you, what can we do you know, to help you? So the question is that uh, SAPRI with the Asian uh, American uh, organization, mm -hmm. how can you translate, how can you take up this issue to the next Thank you. Thank you, and we will uh, address the, the question, you know, both uh, our organizations have been involved in 
uh, promoting interfaith and intercommunity com conversations, um, talking about hate crimes and racial profiling, what, what it means to the people that are attacked, but what it means more broadly for all of us. Because there's a ripple effect when somebody, when a particular community or ethnic group is attacked, any one of us could be in that position. And we want to make sure that all of us are standing in solidarity to condemn these types of attacks. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, I wanted to encourage uh, What are the countries that you invited? What communities? So SAPRI represents the South Asian, which is Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Sri Lankan, Nepalese, and Bhutanese. And, uh, Hi, uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Uh, we represent a lot of organizations, including those in the South Asian community, Korean, Chinese, Filipino, uh, Lao, and Elgin. Uh, pretty much, we are pan-Asian American organizations, so we try to support everybody. Uh, so before we go on, anyone else care to share? What are some important concerns? Yes. Assalamualaikum. Well, we are Vasi. I'm resident of Skoki and I'm part of NCC. Uh, Alhamdulillah, you know we have involved. What we need, I can say, as a be involved in the community, you know, civic and MCC. Actually, we need to get out our self out, get involved in the local politics, get some time, go, there are open meetings all over the city, and especially Skokie is very open to go, board meeting, hearing, all that, but we are not going there. We are just involved in our own family, our massages, our center, our activities. So what I have said, I'm trying to get in there, myself and the Kaka brothers, they are there, sisters, there are a couple few, we only if you come out and we come and look at okay, what can we do? But no, I want everybody to come out there and get involved. It is not for me, like you said, it is not for you, it is for our children. This is our survival. And this is our country, this is our land, and we have to go. So before, I think there are so many things we get involved in there, but what I like to know for myself, I don't know about others, what Sabri has done so far, you know, let's say like a statistic or something, how you come up with, you know. I'm in and out in this arena, but I like to know first, you know, what you have done, what you, you gather for us. So maybe it's more to us to what to do, where we can help you out, what kind of help you need. So give us something where we, we are, we are ready. We need somebody to take the lead. We are followers. It is very seldom we come out of ourselves. So we just need to get. Thank you for doing everything. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. As you, said, you were asking, thank you for that lovely question that you said. But you said what Sapri has done. I stand before you because of Sapri's work. Um, I came to US with an MBA. I used to work in India. But I came here as a dependent to H1B visa. Now Sai Sapri and some more likely NGOs, they put forth um, you know, saying that H4 dependent visa holders should also get EAD, which is uh, the authorization to work. Because of their tireless work, today I stand before you and I'm able to work. So I would say this is one thing that you can see right in front of you. And we hope that whatever concerns you have as a community from here, today we take back with us and further brainstorm it and try to figure out some solutions that we all can work together on. Thank you. And that was a great segue into some of the information. You know, you've asked what are some of the information that we can share um, because we want to uh, collaborate with you to figure out, to problem solve, how to get more people out to the polls. <coughs> so I want to... Um, so, you know, Shweta mentioned uh, Sapri works with the South Asian community. Um, and Shweta mentioned some of the programming and the work that we've done. Uh, why is it important for an organization like Sapri to exist? Because as uh, was mentioned earlier, there are a large number of South Asians, growing number, of, we are a growing part of the larger Illinois and Chicago community. And we need to understand what our community's concerns and issues are. 
Uh, most of the growth that has happened with the South Asian community has been in DuPage and uh, suburban Cook County. And there's been a, a migration, whereas the South Asian community's hub used to be the West Ridge and Devon area, it still is, it's a business and commercial hub, we see that there is a more of a migration towards the suburbs. And what does that tell us? Well, a lot of the information that we're going to talk to you about will be about the 9th Congressional District uh, that includes Morton Grove. But Safari and Asian Americans Advancing Justice are really focusing on the South Asian community in the suburbs for our civic engagement work. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn over to Steve uh, for some more information about the Asian American community. Hi, thank you everybody for uh, welcoming here and letting me speak. I just wanted to share that I'm a, the director of organizing, and sometimes people ask, what does that mean that you are a community organizer? Some people may remember when uh, President Obama first ran, there was a lot of talk about how in a previous job he was a community organizer. The best way I like to uh, explain it is that uh, my job is to really serve the community. That if there are significant needs, whether it be about education or healthcare or whatever, that my job is to go and make sure I'm with the community members to hear what those issues are and then help the community and work alongside the community to, to build the uh, political power and just to build our numbers enough so we can make the difference. So that is what my job is and uh, I am very blessed to be here. Um, I also started a youth program at my organization called Kinetic that goes in Chicago Public Schools. And actually, a lot of the core leaders in my program uh, are Muslim youth. And they're from various ethnicities. Um, and they've done incredible, incredible work, which I would like to share at some point in the future. Um, but moving forward, it's the Asian American demographic data. This is some national information that you have in front of you. So nationally, Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial population. In 2015, the estimate is that we're at about 20 million already. So we are, we are a big community. By 2065, Asians are projected to be the largest immigrant group in the U.S. So right now, whenever people think about immigrants, they usually think about the Latino community. But in 2065, just a short, just 50 years, right? If you have children, likely in their lifetime, they are going to be part of the largest immigrant community in the United States. Now in 2012, it says, the bold says that there's 333,000 CVAP. What that means is that it's the citizen voting age population in the state of Illinois. 333,000 and that was in 2012. So again, that means there's 333,000 Asians who are citizens and 18 and older, meaning that they can vote. So those are the people that if there was an election tomorrow, we can get 333,000 people to the polls. It's a lot of people. Uh, from 2000 to 2010, this amount grew by 36%. And this growth is continuing. Like Rima shared, especially in the South Asian community. There is great growth in population, which means the amount of potential voters is just continuing to rise for the South Asian community. In Illinois, the Asian American population grew by 41% in 2000 to 2010. And again, a big chunk of that was coming from the South Asian community. So moving forward, the highest concentrations of Asians by congressional district here in Illinois. So you see some numbers, those are all congressional districts. Uh, right now we are in Morton Grove, right? And that is in the 9th congressional district. Uh, there are many South Asians, of course, in the 8th congressional district and also in the 10th congressional district. So this is just a breakdown and it supports what Rima was saying. That for the South Asian community, a lot of people are starting to move into the suburbs. Similarly for Koreans, we saw in the late 80s to 90s, a lot of my community started to move out into the suburbs, actually in these same congressional districts as well. Yeah. So, 
you know, we talked about South Asians are one of the, the, the largest ethnic group in Illinois. Um, we, I shared with you that by 2010, there were 242,000 South Asians in Illinois. We also shared with you that we're the fastest growing, that 55% growth trajectory that, that I talked to you about. So that tells you some of the power, potential of power in numbers that we have. But numbers alone don't mean power. They don't equal power. <coughs> what, in order to gain power, what we need to do is make our voices heard. And one of the best ways to do that is to go out to vote. We need to make our concerns and issues heard at the polls. We need to hold our elected officials accountable to our communities. Um, and Voting is the way that we can gain respect from elected officials. So that South Asians, there's no reason why South Asian communities shouldn't be one of the stops for candidates as they're going around during their campaign to woo support. They should be coming to us. And in fact, not only during their campaigns, they should be coming to us all year round to say, what are some of the issues that is important to your community? What should I be working for? What is my uh, uh, agenda and, and how should that be shaped because they should be coming to us for that information. So I'm going to, oh, go ahead, please. On how do you come up with these numbers, you know, because there's no way to identify uh, the, I mean, uh, I mean, the, in the, I mean, even in census, and the, the, they don't, uh, there's nothing to identify from where you are. So how do you come up with these numbers? Sure, so a lot of these numbers are being pulled from different sources. Uh, my organization has a national, uh, we're part of a national affiliation, and so we're able to put a significant amount of resources to looking through voter files. So s different states have voter files, um, and there's actually this voter database that our organization has access to. And so I don't know if any of you lately have been getting any calls from candidates saying that, hey, I would like you to vote for this way or this way. The reason why you get so many calls is once you register to vote, that information is public, right? And so uh, our organization, along with many others, and including partisan campaigns, we're nonpartisan, we don't support anybody, but that info is accessible for the past history. So we basically pull all of that information together. It's not exact, but it's, it's pretty good. Uh, so I'm going to move forward and show you a little bit about the voting age population by congressional district. So, you know, we discussed the 8th congressional district, 9th congressional district, and 10th congressional district has a lot of uh, Asian Americans. So in the 9th, there's a total population of 85,469 Asians, and the voting age population is 68,137. Now, the amount registered in the 9th Congressional District, in this, these borders, it's only 22,499. So, on one hand, we see that and we're like, ah, that's not good enough. We need to do better. But the other thing is, there's a lot of opportunity. If we just focus some more and organize some more, we can do a lot of, we can have a lot of power and move a lot of people. In the eight, that's an area that uh, I actually, my parents are in, Palatine, Schaumburg, Kaufman Estates. I grew up in that area. Uh, there's 89,946 Asian Americans, 64,000 roughly that are a voting age population, 19,000 registered voters. And you see that in the 10th Congressional District too. So the thing I want to talk to you about is, one thing that we hear all the time from Asian communities is, we're so small, right? State population, we're about 5%. So people are like, what can we do in the voting? Even if we vote, we're such a small number, we can't really make a difference. I want to introduce you to the idea of the margin of victory. So what the margin of victory is, the number of votes between the first place, the person who wins the... And if you look at the far right, 
the MOV, the margin of victory between the first place and the second place in 2010 was only 290 votes. That's it. Which means this community right here, if all of you got maybe 10 people to go vote each, you could have won that election for a candidate. Right? It's a small margin between first place and second place. This is the information that's really important. If we look at the 10th Congressional District, all the way at the right, the margin of victory, again, in 2010, between the first place, the person who won the candidacy, and the second place, only 4,650 votes. And we have 17,960 Asians registered in that district. So much more than the victory was. We could really change elections by getting our community out to vote. It's a small number, you'll be surprised, a lot of times. So what does this mean for the South Asian population? So in the 8th Congressional District, there's 60,000 South Asian community. Like we said, in 2010, it was only 290 votes. The South Asian community, if on one day, the day before election day, you called everyone, got your friends and family, you went out to vote, you can change that election like that very easily. In the 10th Congressional District, 30,000 South Asians, only 4,650 votes. Now the HD shows a House District. The 56th House District actually has a lot of uh, South Asians. It's like that Elk Grove area, if you're familiar with that area, a lot of South Asians, right? There's 17.7 thousand South Asians in that district, that House district. The margin of victory in 2014 was only 900 votes. Only 900. In the 44th House district, which is like the Schomburg area, a lot of South Asians, one of the highest concentrations of South Asians in the suburbs. In that House district, 16.7 thousand South Asians, the margin of victory was only 1,900. So again, just imagine if we did some more voter education, a little bit more voter outreach, especially institutions and organizations like this one, they are the ones that the research shows can really move the community to go vote. You all have so much power in this room right now that if you just got that much more of your community, you can literally change how a vote and an election goes. A lot of power. And that goes back to why it's important for all of us, each one of us in the South Asian community, our community leaders, um, to speak up. You know, we talked about how little, how few votes make the difference. If we are consistently speaking up and using our votes to express what our issues and concerns are, it goes back to the idea of we need to have elected officials listen when we talk. And the way to do that is to do turn elections as Steve is suggesting. So that little line at the bottom, I did some more research, our organization just gave me some more information. So as far as the Asian American community, in 13 of the House districts, so 13 races in 2014, where there was a Republican-Democrat against each other, in 13 of them, the Asian American registered voters covers 90% of the margin of victory. So in 13 races, if our collective community went out to vote, we could change the elections. In 13 House districts, I'll go into a little later what that really means, but to, in the Illinois State Legislature, to be able to move 13 votes around a piece of policy or a law that you want, it's a big, big number. Very big number. So there's a lot of incredible potential. Now, with opportunity, that means there's also another side to it. I just, I just got this information literally on Friday. Um, 
And what this shows you is different ethnic groups in the state of Illinois broken down by how frequently they vote. So they can either be registered, but they're non-voters, means they don't ever vote. Occasional voters, so maybe in the past four presidential elections, they may have voted one, two, yeah, one or two times. Or frequent voters, which means like in the past four major elections, they probably voted three or four times. So I'm gonna direct your attention because they're all pretty much similar rates but if you look at the Indian American registered voters, for registered voters, again, so these are people who can vote, non-voters are 41.56%, so people who do not go vote. Occasional is 51.61%, and the amount of frequent voters in the Indian American community is 6.83%. So I don't want you to feel too bad about this, right? If you look across the bottom, it's pretty consistent. The one that's a major difference is Japanese American voters, but that's because many of them are fourth generation at this point. They have a long history of being here and engaging in voting and voting. They had to make that change, right? But we don't probably want to wait until our fourth or fifth generation to have that power, right? We want to start doing it right now, if possible. Okay, but, you know, does anybody had uh, that they need to search? What is, what's the problem? Why uh, Asian Americans and Indo Americans go up? We are blessed, we have a good education, a good jobs, we are well connected. I mean, it's not that dumb people. What is the reason? Why, what, what, can you, can you decide from that? Well, let me ask you. I'm sure many of you have friends and maybe family members who do not go vote. And I, I certainly do, even though I do this work. When you talk to your friends and family members, what are some of the reasons that you think? There's excuses. What kind of excuses do you hear? The main excuse is, oh, my what is that going to count? My one point is not going to make any difference. Sure. Come on, if you don't get out and walk, it's going to make a difference. But if you don't go, it's not mm -hmm. going to make a difference. That's true. So the number one reason is, oh, it's not going to make a difference. Right. But like you said, <coughs> the difference between the first and the second, it's a small exactly. margin. Right. And right. we can make a difference. Right. But people think, oh, it's not, you know, it's not going to make a difference. I've heard but, uh, there is something but, about corruption. But, but I'm saying that, of course, he has opinion, I have uh -huh, opinion. Uh -huh. But in a proper search work, has anything has been looked into that? Sure, let me, um, I will address that in a second, yes. Yeah, I have a thing that, you know, just mobilizing the voters to come and register and vote. But if ever the South Asian community has done that, just to mobilize and focus on a point where you have a block voting, mm. which will give in a bigger impact <laughs> on the uh, like uh, a political system that block voting, you have a bigger issue and they will come more forward, even the candidates, that, well, if I'm talking to this community, I have that many votes. Mm -hmm. So we should go onto the block voting and well, should, decide should, should, which one the candidate we should vote. Should is a different word, brother. You have done no. really research across oriented yes. objectives. Uh, unfortunately, some of my centers or massages do not promote voting. We have a kutba sermon every Friday and I've been attending that for the last hundred years. <laughs> He's a young man. Uh, uh, so we have to also talk to our imams. And they are not politically involved and politically correct. Yeah, if you'll allow me to give you um, kind of a parallel with the community I come from, Korean community. Also, faith institutions are a significant part of that community. Uh, one thing that we see various reasons. One reason is language is a barrier for some in our community. And so if you don't have the translated ballots, which SAPRI and our organizations have worked very hard in certain districts to make sure that translated ballots and interpretations are available. So that's one. Another barrier that we see from our communities is the, the history, 
cultural history with politics and the homeland. So depending on funders that are like, oh, we want to see you know more people voting from this community, it's still you know there's we still need to build more and more resources devoted to civic engagement, devoted to voting to get more people out so we can talk to all of our leaders, talk to all of our youth to make sure that they understand how to vote and where to go vote. Um, that's one of the biggest barriers that the research shows. It's that, not that people are like, I don't want to vote, I hate voting. Sometimes it's just that they're not really sure where to go or how to vote. And that simple bit of knowledge can be a big difference. That's exactly the point I was gonna not understanding how the process works. Do you have um, a simple step-by-step -step way of explaining it? Or do you know of a, a website that you know we can direct people to and say, you know, explain how to vote and when the deadlines are? Because I think a lot of people will go to the primary, they don't even know that they're gonna get the two choices right away they're confused. So mm -hmm. is there some place where someone has written a very simple procedure? Yeah. Yeah, those yeah, the, those guides definitely exist. And another thing, if it's a need in the community, one thing that the Board of Elections was happy to do is they often actually bring the machines um, prior to the elections. If there's community members who like, when they're there, so, that, so they're not intimidated, you can go through practicing how to actually vote on election day. But yes, those guides exist. And, and we, we would, you know, we would be happy to come back um, and, and do that kind of demonstration along with the Board of Elections for your members, um, for your community. Th that is what we want to do on a nonpartisan basis, not promoting any candidate or party, but we want to go out and arm people with the information they need to make it as easy and as pleasant as possible to go out to vote. Uh, question? Yeah. Earlier you had mentioned that uh, you'd like to see the politicians come to organizations like you to ask, you know, what uh, uh, can be done or what are the issues, but by to our the community. Person, community, to our community, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, is it possible or is, has Sabri done that kind of work uh, opposite way that tell them that, okay, these are the issues of this community, you know, what are you going to do about this? Absolutely. So on a range of issues, we work with both local and state officials. Uh, Steve mentioned language access. You know, one of the ways that SAPRI has been involved is uh, advocacy to the local uh, Cook County and City of Chicago boards uh, when they were required to provide Hindi ballots and assistance, oral assistance in Gujarati, Hindi, and Urdu. We worked with the uh, Board of Elections to help them implement that requirement and also work with translations. And uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago and SAPRI have been involved in, in that process. We continue to be involved. We'll be talking a little bit later about we're uh, actively recruiting and training bilingual election judges. Again, to make it easier for people who might be limited English proficient or who are just uh, first-time voters or not as familiar with the voting system, to have people armed with the knowledge, a friendly face, uh, bilingual who can talk in multiple languages, to be able to help people access their right to vote. My name is Hamidullah Khan. I am with the Pakistani community. And I see a lot of my friends, uh, of, of course, when gentleman is 100 years old, and uh, <laughs> I am not that old, but he's my friend. And, and very nice to see, you know, Nashima, I know her father, uh, by the way. So just to tell you, I could see all the faces, and many of my friends are here, long-time friends. They are involved from the very first day. I don't see any young person like 21 years old where are those people? Just my question, please. How we can motivate them? How we can bring them here? Like these gentlemen or ladies, they have been involved with the community work, like you said, community involvement or engagement or whatever, like for a long time. But unfortunately, we don't see. But I, I just saw Nashima, so I was so happy that I, was, I knew his father, and we used to attend meeting in their basement sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where are those? I tried 
as I said, I am involved with the community and a long time, and I, I graduated from Roosevelt in MPA 1975. So I was in this system, you know, I knew that how the politics goes in Chicago. But I tried a lot of time that young people will come. Whatever way, you know, you, like you, you have had that. But I could not motivate them. Sometimes they say, why we should give the fund? Another thing, voting and, you know, vote and we call note. <laughs> you pay vote and, you know, dollar or whatever money. That we are, not, we are we just shy of. People doing business at Jivan Avenue, is that correct? And it is a popular area for not only for South Asian, they say it is the most diverse area in that, uh, uh, they say. They, are, they live outside, but they come and do the business. But once we do the like fundraising, etc., uh, they, they fail there, I would say that. So please tell me what we can do to bring those young generation here. Thank you. One is next to you. Sure. Uh, so I want to address, I heard we have just a short amount of time yet uh, left, so I will, if you'll uh, give me a little bit of time, I'll come back to the youth. It's a, it's a passion of mine, so I'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, so I want to just, so many different issues have come up, right, that are important to this community, and I want to walk you through just the rest of why we think voting is important. I'll tell you what, for my organization, we don't try to get so many people to vote just for, them, right? just for the numbers. It's because there are real issues that you all have already identified that we need to change, right? That are not fair, that are not just for our community. So it's about recognition and respect, uh, but it's about sometimes justice. So you mentioned violence, right? And we know in Darien, Illinois, in the top left corner, uh, there was a sick man who was brutalized, right? victim of violence. And this is something that's happening in, in a lot of communities. So on the far right, it's a video clip from a salon in the city of Chicago, where a Chinese American woman who was naturalized, a US citizen, was actually beat by the Chicago Police Department. And they said, go back to where you came from. I'm gonna put you in a UPS box and send you back. I'm gonna kill you and your family. Really awful things. This is happening from a police officer. We know that Governor Rauner had all of this, he was one of the uh, governors who said that he didn't want to accept Syrian refugees into the state of Illinois, right? Awful, awful, horrible awful. things, right? Education, I see a young person here, I see a couple young people. Yes. So one thing that happened as the governor was explaining his new budget was that there was some debate over MAP grants. MAP grants is a need-based grant, financial aid for students who uh, want to attend university. And Rauner decided that he wanted to veto the MAP grant bill, right? It's one thing that this governor said. Uh, and we know right now that for those students who come from low-income backgrounds, some of them are being forced to drop out of school right now because they have to work, because they support their families and they have to pay for their own tuition. And this is not something we want. So I'm sure some of you know that tuition in the state of Illinois, even for our state schools, our public universities, it is out of control. I know I may not look it, I'm 36 years old, and when I compare the tuition when I was graduating from high school to now, I mean, I, I can't believe it. I'm still paying off student loans too, so it hurts, it hurts me too. So I know for the parents in this room, that this is a big, big issue that we need to address, and it's one of the reasons why to vote right now. Not just because of the presidential, the state races are very, very important. We are in month eight in this state of not having a state budget. Month eight. And in that time, the Immigrant Services Line Item, which is a program that funds interpretation and translation for communities like ours, so they could get public benefits, that has been completely eliminated, zero. The other funding that's been cut for our seniors and our elders in our community, some get in-care, home care services, that has been cut dramatically. And this has happened across the board. One of the areas where 
it's awful, but they call it the they call it the Good Friday Massacre because the first cut he had was continually suffering. I mean, just family, because their kids are getting hurt, parents are getting hurt because they have to work more jobs, there's not enough money for childcare, and then our seniors and elders are being hurt because they're not getting the services that they need. This is hitting a whole family unit, not just individuals. So this is a rally. My organization organized a rally of 2,000 people in downtown to say, hey, we need our services. We need you to handle your political stuff however you want, but that shouldn't stop you from giving money to the organizations that provide services to our community. So we work with a lot of different legislators. Some of you asked, do you ever go to the legislators and talk? It's a primary job of my organization. So we have something called the Asian American Legislative Caucus. It's made up of legislators on both sides of the aisle, both Republican and Democrat, and we meet with them and we say, hey, look, these are the five things that we need from you. Will you support our community? Because if you want us to go out and vote and become citizens, we need your help. Thank you. We need you to work for us. We don't work for you. We're not here to give you your own votes and give you money. Actually, your job is to do what we need to see happen. So we get a group of these Democrats and Republicans together to make our voice heard. And actually, we have a meeting coming up um, in just two weeks to make this case. So one more reason why voting, there's so much talk about the federal race, and there's everything because people are saying really awful things right now <laughs> in the presidential election. I mean, horrible, horrible things. But I want you to also be very aware of the state race. Our state government actually holds a lot of power for our everyday lives. Sometimes the president does something, but you don't really necessarily feel it, maybe. But the state government, their decisions are the ones that are hurting you every day or helping you every day. So I want to show you an example. This is Republican uh, Representative Fred Crespo. He's a Democrat in the 44th district, which is one of the highest Schomburg area, high South Asian concentration. He's a, he's a rising star on, in that party. So what I'm showing you here is the committees that he's a part of. So if something is gonna become law, it has to come from a committee and then go out and then it gets voted on by all the legislators. So the committee is very important. So, here, he is in the Committee for Elementary and Secondary Education. So the reason why I bring this up is in the work that I do with youth in the city, they are hearing, they, so the Muslim youth in particular, they're being called on the way to school, they're being yelled at, they're terrorists, right? Racial and religious profiling is happening within their schools. And my organization wants to stop that. Now, I imagine this probably is also happening in the suburbs, too, right? We're in an awful time where there's a lot of public hate. So if you want to make a difference, right, and we want to get some state legislation passed where they really have to honor our cultures and our religions and our faiths, that you actually want to have a good relationship with people like this. He's in one of the most important committees to get a law passed, right? I'll give you another example. It's a Republican, Senator Matt Murphy, 27th Senate District. Those first two lines, Appropriations 1 and Appropriations 2, when we're talking about financial decisions of what the state will fund, this is the most powerful committee. You want to get any law passed where it's going to cost money to? You need to have an ally in appropriations. So I just want you to know that the state race is so important. You can't just focus on the big federal presidential races. You have to be active on the state races too. Um, I know we're running short on time, so I want to just quickly go over the slide, but I want to come back to the question about what are we doing to get some of our youth involved? And that's where we want to spend most of our time. Uh, this is uh, uh, slide shows uh, 
working again with local and state officials to uh, respond to hate crimes and racial profiling. My organization, SAFRI, worked on resolutions both at the local level and the state level denouncing hate and really forcing our elected officials to take a stand verbally and in person to say we're not going to stand for this type of conduct. We're not going to stand for this type of rhetoric. And that is very important. So how our organizations can serve the community is we can take the issues and concerns that you are telling us, and we take that up to the local officials, as Steve has said. But we also need you directly involved in the voting. And so if we can uh, go to the slide. Um, you know, we, we asked about how both of our organizations are trying to get um, youth involved and our community members involved. And Shweta is going to tell you about the four ways that each of you and your uh, kids and your neighbors can get involved right now to get our South Asian community out to the polls. Okay, so currently we are having water mobilization and water awareness program, this being one. We are supporting water registration. The higher the number of registered voters are there, if you saw the numbers, the registered voters were also not substantial as compared to the ones who could vote. Right? So that is one area where we need all the uh, eligible voters to come out and register themselves. The second thing would be voter turnout. People go out and actually vote. Whatever be their excuse, it is real, it is real. The excuses are real. But there is, there are so many things that can be done. There is email ballot, there is early voting. So you need to have some kind of information about all that so that that does not become a hindrance. And our organizations are actually doing phone banking. So we're getting a lot of young people involved. We've cut, uh, with Asian Americans Advancing Justice, we've cut lists of South Asian voters, and we're calling them and saying, can we count on you to go vote at the primary election? And we constantly call them. Like, it's like, uh, you might, might have heard from us. If we are, like, we will ask you, what time would you go vote? How are you planning to go? Just to make you commit to it, so that you just don't falter. You think through the whole process and just go out and vote. Just so you know, that is something we can do here. We can bring phones, we can bring laptops. If you want you as community members or your young people to make calls, we can bring the whole thing here so you can do it right out of here. Yeah. And we're doing water protection. We did talk about it to have a familiar face at the polling booth so that you don't feel threatened. If you have a question, you feel welcome in the whole environment, go ahead, ask where to go, what to do. So that is about that, how we are going to serve and mobilize the people to go ahead and vote. Thank you so much. I know we're over the time, that we, uh, but we got some great questions and we hope that we provided you the information. We're going to stick around, so if you have more questions, please Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I wish we had another hour, um, but um, the prayer is starting. I just want to ask Akhtar uh, uh, or Kai to come over here. I do want to let you guys know one thing. This, as a teacher, it's hard for me not to just think of schools, and I know that that's such a huge deal. I want you to know that 40% of our high school district is Asian. Only about 6% of the teachers are Asian. And I remember, and actually that's increased since I've been here. When I came here, there was one teacher. And I remember talking to the principal, going to town hall meetings, and really actually fighting with the superintendent. And I said, I'll never apply for a job in this district because I have to fight with these people about this. And I said, please don't insult us by saying you hire the best because that's implying that we're not as good. And I talked to the principal and I said, you know, I want you to know, and he said, you know, we're hiring very diverse. I said, you know, I want to remind you, diversity just doesn't mean Hispanic and black. I need you, we need you to hire the next year. This sounds crazy. The next year, he hired three Asian people to work at Now's Norm. So it does make a difference if we go and we insist, because these are not all bad people. They just don't know that we care. Uh, 
now inshallah we'll conclude but you can still like Rima mentioned you know that come back after the prayer or if you have any questions you know they'll be more than happy to be around here and answer the questions here from the team and from our guests also and please make it easy for all of us in the coming months subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen thank you all thank you alaikum everyone thank you